Welcome to our live streamed Holocaust Survivor Talk. Uh, my name is Michael Morgenstern. I am an educator at the museum. And today you have the honor and privilege of listening to Erica Fabian, a Holocaust survivor from Hungary, who will share her story with you. And listen to while Erica shares her story, you can type in questions in the comments and afterwards we'll relay those questions to Erica and she'll answer them. So welcome Erica, we're so happy to have you here this Sunday and we are honored to listen to your story. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, my story begins when I was four years old or maybe a little earlier when I was three years old and Hungary where I lived in the capital with my family in Budapest um, joined the war. My father disappeared when I was three years old. He was taken to a labor camp in Bergen-Belsen and my last memory of my, the rest of my family is my grandparents whom we visited. Can you show the picture of my grandparents, please? Whom we visited when I was maybe about two years old. And that's, those are my father's parents. And that's the last time I have been with them. I don't remember them at all. We can go back to my story. Uh, they actually were taken to a concentration camp with the rest of my mother's family from a small town in Debrecen. Actually, it's the sec third biggest town in Hungary. And so I then was left with my mother and my sister, Judith, who was three years older than me. You can show her picture with me, please. And the three of us were basically left alone and the government told us to move out of our apartment to a smaller apartment, which had a big yellow star on it because in Hungary, all Jews had to wear a yellow star on their clothing when they went out shopping and the buildings some buildings were designated for Jews to live in only, and those had big yellow stars on the door, on the front door of the building. So my first memory was living in this new place in an apartment, and it was pitch dark, three, four o'clock in the morning. I was awakened because there was a violent banging. You can go back to me, please violent banging on our front door and my sister and my mother and I were sleeping in one big double bed and of course we all woke up to this banging and my mother said somebody's at the door and then we heard a loudspeaker which said everybody get dressed gather a day's food and come downstairs to the courtyard of the building Hungarian buildings have a big courtyard when you enter the main gate and all the apartments are, you have to go up the stairs and they're around a hallway or a corridor that runs usually in a U-shaped form. So we were on the first floor and we could hear all the residents in the building slowly getting out of their apartments and going down the staircases and gathering in the courtyard. My mother jumped out of bed and said, let's get dressed and let's go. And my sister jumped out of bed and said, we're not going and grabbed onto my mother's legs and held on to her and refused to let her move. So they were standing in the middle of the room and my mother said, you know what's gonna happen if they break the door down because all this time they were still knocking on the door. And my sister said, I don't care, we're not going. They were whispering, of course. So there they stood fighting and all of a sudden the banging stopped and 
within a little while, they were frozen in the middle of the bedroom. And I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. So I covered myself up under the blankets and kept quiet. My sister, my mother stood in the middle of the room, listening to the feet below us going down to the courtyard. And then after a while, we heard them shuffling out through the front gate of the building till there was nobody left in the building and there was this deadly silence. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where there's nobody around and there's absolutely no sound. The sound itself has sort of a, a weight and it's unbelievable quiet. So when that happened, my mother looked at the clock on the wall and she said, well, it's only five o'clock in the morning. Let's go back to sleep. We can't go anywhere right now, but we're gonna have to leave from here. So we went back to sleep for a while, all three of us. And she woke us up again around seven o'clock in the morning. And we got out of bed, we got dressed. We each had a cup of coffee and a piece of bread. My mother collected some food that she put in her little briefcase. And she told us to put some warm clothing like an extra sweater, uh, an extra skirt into a little briefcase. And we were ready to leave. We went to the front door to and just about, she was just about to open the door when there was a shadow on the glass window of the front door. And we all pulled back. My mother said, quiet. And then there was a knock on the wall, on the window. And a man's voice said, Mrs. Fabian, Mrs. Fabian, I'm your neighbor. I don't remember his name, but um, open the door. I want to talk to you. So we knew him, he lived next door to us. So my mother opened the door and he said, uh, I am the one who told the Nazis that you had left already. And that's why they stopped banging on your door. So in fact, he saved our lives. And then he said, do you know where you're going or you have a place to go? And my mother said, no idea, but I'll, I'll have to figure something out. So he said, there is a new Swedish safe house down by the Danube. And he gave my mother the address. And he said, if you have a Swedish safe pass, you could go there. And my mother said, yes, we do. And thank you very much. We'll go there. A Swedish safe pass was something that was handed out from a Swedish, from the Swedish consulate by a Swedish diplomat, Wallenberg, who was a, came from a very wealthy Swedish family. And he bought up a number of buildings in Budapest and handed out what was called a safe pass. And anybody who had it could live in the buildings that were under his protection and therefore under the protection of the Swedish government. So theoretically, if you lived in a Swedish safe house, you were safe from deportation. So my mother had a safe pass for all of us and she said, okay, we can go to the safe house. We were on the way to the safe house. It was outside, very, very cold, raining. And she said, we have to stop. I have to make a phone call. In Hungary, the phone booths are like little glass booths for one person only. So my sister Judith and I stayed outside in the rain while she made a call to her best friend, Irene. Irene also had a safe pass. And my mother was hoping that she would still at home, she would be still at home instead of being deported as we almost had been earlier. Uh, turns out Irene answered the phone and my mother told her, we're going to this safe house down by the Danube, here's the address, meet us there. The reason she did that was that this very day, my mother was supposed to go to a small Hungarian village 
and collect Christian papers for us, given to us by a former maid who used to work for us from the time I was born or my sister was born. And the Hungarian rules that happened to be around 1943 or somewhere around there were that no Christian could work for Jews. So the maid had to leave. And when she left, she gave my mother her family's name and address in a little village in Northern Hungary and said, if you need anything, if I can do anything for you, please let me know. So when my father was deported and we had to move to this smaller apartment, my mother wrote to the maid and sent her money and said, can you please get us some birth certificates that correspond to our ages and send them back to me or I'll come and get them uh, because otherwise we won't survive the war. She also asked for a birth certificate for her best friend, Irene. And Irene was supposed to come to this apartment we were staying in. So my mother this very day could take a train to the village where the maid lived and pick up all these papers. Now we were heading for the safe house and meeting Irene there, but my mother didn't know quite how this was going to work out. So she called Irene, that's why she called Irene and said, come meet us at the safe house. When we got to the safe house, it was like seven or eight o'clock. It was about eight o'clock in the morning. And we walked in and there is always a concierge in the building right next to the front door. There is a little apartment with a room that has a big window. And so the concierge can see everybody who comes and goes in the building. Um, when we walked in, my mother handed the concierge our safe passes. And he said, fine, you can go upstairs. And my mother said, no, we'll wait till my friend gets here. She also has a safe pass. So we sat on a bench for a while and uh, waited for Irene. Irene arrived, she checked in and we went upstairs and there was this huge room, completely empty. And Irene said, look at this, nobody is here. My mother said, it's very early in the morning wait till later. And Irene said, let's just settle down. And she was about ready to sit down somewhere when my mother went over to the far corner of the room where there was a little door and she opened the door and it was like a little pantry. And the pantry had a sink with running water and the glass wind and the window that looked outside. And my mother said to us, this is where we're staying. Irene said, why? Look at this entire room, it's all empty. And my mother answered her, just wait. This is where we're staying. So we all went into the little room. My mother closed the door and we settled in. And it turned out that by three, four o'clock in the afternoon, the room outside of us was filling up so fast that there wasn't a space to walk around. Families came in with young children, old people came in, couples came in, uh, all refugees who somehow managed to escape from being rounded up by the Hungarian Nazis. And the room was absolutely filled. The way to the bathroom was through this big room. So we could see how full it was because we had to kind of carefully weave our way through bodies and feet and people sitting and lying all around. There was absolutely not an inch of floor space to walk by. So we were quite comfortable actually in our little room and went to sleep. We had something to eat. It turned out that Irene, brought her suitcase full of food. She said she traded some candlesticks and what silver stuff for food from her neighbors. So she brought food and my mother had brought some food. So we had 
a very light snack of something, I don't remember, probably bread and some cold cuts, salami or something like that, typical Hungarian food. And we went to sleep. There was no electricity, so it was easy to go to sleep early. It was dark and we slept. And I don't know if it was that very night or we spent one more day there and Irene and my mother were trying to figure out whether my mother could go to that village and leave Irene and my sister and me with here in this safe house. When that night, very early in the morning, like again, three, four, maybe four or five in the morning, I don't know. Um, we heard a loudspeaker. We heard boots in the next room and the loud loudspeaker said, everybody hand over their safe passes. We'll hand them back to you in the morning. We need to see who is here. My mother said, we're not handing over our safe passes. We have no idea who these people are. And we don't know why they're taking the safe passes this early in the morning, but we're not handing over ours. So she very quickly, she always had a notebook with her, tore some pieces of paper up to the size of the safe passes. And when they knocked on our door and shouted safe passes, she handed over these pieces of paper. And then when the room became quiet again next door to us, she said, we can sleep a couple of hours, but as soon as it gets light, we have to leave because when they really look at the safe passes and they discover that four of them are just pieces of paper and they'll be able to identify the people who handed over the safe passes, they'll know it was us. So we absolutely have to leave. So again, we got up very early. We had some water, a piece of bread, put, on co put our coats on and left the room. And we had to walk very, very carefully through the big room because people were sleeping all over the place and there was barely any room. In fact, it was so difficult to walk that I almost stepped on somebody's extended hand on the floor. And being four years old, I started to giggle. And my sister whispered in my ear, shut up or I'll kill you. I was more afraid of my sister than my mother, actually, because my sister never hesitated to hit me. So we left the room, went downstairs, knocked on the concierge's door, and he said, where are you going? And my mother said, we have to leave right away. And I saw her shaking hands with him, and I figured she probably handed him some money. By that time, I knew that whenever you needed to get something done in Hungary, you had to bribe somebody. So she, so the concierge let us out the front door and it started to snow. It was early in the morning, but the streetcars were running. And Irene said, where are we going? And my mother said, I don't know, but I have an idea. So let's get on the streetcar. We took one or two streetcars and we went across the Danube River to the other side of the city. Budapest is divided into Buda and Pest. Buda is the hilly side and Pest is the flat side. We always lived on the, lived on the Pest side and Buda was known for beautiful villas and very elegant homes and the very wealthy lived there. <clears throat> so we took um, a couple of streetcars, and then we took a bus and we went across the Danube to the Buddha side. And by this time it was snowing quite heavily. So we walked and tried not to slip. And we kept walking and walking to what seemed to me forever and up the hill into the hills of the very elegant homes. And finally we got to a gate which was like a white wrought iron gate, very beautiful. And my mother rang the bell on the gate and from the house, a man came out still in his morning robe, 
And he saw us at the gate and he said, Mrs. Fabian, what are you doing here? And then he saw that Irene was there and my sister and I were there. And he said, come in, come in really quickly. So he took us into his house. We took our coats off. It was nice and warm there. And my mother very quickly explained to him what had happened to us. And he took us into his kitchen. His wife was there. And in typical Hungarian fashion, she uh, prepared some food for us, coffee and bread and cheese and butter, and invited us to sit down and have breakfast while my mother was telling that she didn't know what to do because she had to go and pick up these papers in the village, which was like a day's journey from the capital. So it would take her a day to get there, probably a day or two to get the paperwork organized, putting in new names and signatures, and then another day to come back. So she said she didn't want to leave Irene and, and her children at the safe house. Obviously, it wasn't safe. So she didn't know what to do, and she came to this doctor. Now, the doctor was somebody who was very good friends with my father. My father used to uh, create um, surgical instruments for him because my father studied blacksmithing when he was a young man and he had a wholesale hardware store as an adult. That was his occupation. And this doctor and my father used to row together uh, from Budapest to Vienna and back. They were both sportsmen. So they really forged a very close friendship. And now my mother was turning to this doctor in absence of my father. And the doctor thought about it during breakfast. And then he said, you know, I could take Irene to the hospital and she could work as an orderly or, you know, cleaning up toilets and, and rooms. That's not a problem. And you could take the train, but you can't take the children. So, ah, he said, I know what to do. I can put the children into the Red Cross hospital and they would just have to pretend that they're sick. Well, that wasn't very difficult because my sister and I always had some form of a cold or another. And I had a specific talent. I could throw up at will. Uh, I had a very uh, sensitive stomach. And if my mother asked me to eat something that I didn't want to eat, I would say to her, no, I can't eat that or I'll throw up. And if she forced me to eat it, I would throw up. I don't know how I did it. I lost the talent after the war. But I said, yeah, I could do that. So the doctor gave us both addresses for his hospital where he worked and for uh, the Red Cross. And we left. <clears throat> we had to leave before their housekeeper got there at eight o'clock in the morning because you couldn't trust anybody and the housekeeper could have given us up to the Nazis. So Irene went with the doctor and my mother took us to the Red Cross Hospital where we had no problem being checked in as very sick. We pretended to have terrible colds and I complained about my stomach and they put us into the room where all the other sick children were being housed. And this was a very, very large room, very long. And they had two rows of beds against the wall, quite tight. And my mother said she will be back in a couple of days and we should behave. And she left and we were put into bed we were given covers. We were told not to get undressed because there were no pajamas. So we stayed in our clothing. We put our little briefcase under the bed, our shoes under the bed and stayed in bed. Periodically, the doctors and nurses would come around and check on all the children, including us. And we didn't have temperature, but we, when the doctors were there, we could cough and they could see that we weren't well. So everything was fine, except in between, I was getting really bored. So my sister, to keep me quiet, started telling me a fairy tale. 
she had gone to school. She was at this point seven years old and we were both avid readers. I learned to read with her when she was six and I was three. And we liked to read a lot of children's stories. So um, she started telling me a story. And as soon as she did that, all of a sudden, any children who weren't really deadly sick started gathering around us. And pretty soon we had a whole group of kids sitting partially in our beds or sitting on the floor listening to the story. So that's how we spent the rest of the afternoon. And in the evening, we were given some very thin, uh, typical Hungarian soup. It's a caraway soup that you fry a little bit of flour, you add some water, you add some caraway seeds, and you cook it till the liquid acquires caraway seed taste. And that was our dinner with a piece of bread, and we were told to go to bed. The same thing happened the next day. We would have caraway soup in the morning with bread, caraway soup for lunch with bread, same for dinner. And my sister was entertaining us, telling us more stories. So it really wasn't bad. But by the second night of this, I said to my sister, when do you think our mother is going to come? And my sister said, I don't know. You better keep quiet or I'll hit you. And that always did it. I would always keep quiet when she threatened me. I didn't like being hit. So we went to sleep. And instead of the usual time, the following morning, it was still very dark when the nurses came in and woke all of us up and said, um, drink your soup. Everybody got some hot caraway soup and bread. Drink your soup and get dressed. And we all have to, and you all have to come downstairs in front of the building. Now, this was very scary. We drank our soup because my sister told me to do it or she would hit me. But she said, I'll share my bread with you and take your bread and put it in your briefcase because we don't know when we might get fed again. And this is kind of an interesting thing that I was only four years old at the time, but this keeping food with me at all times stayed with me for the rest of my life. I never go anywhere without having something in my car at this stage or something in my suitcase if I'm traveling or in my handbag if I'm going even going shopping. I always carry some food. So I put the piece of bread in, the, in my briefcase and we were dressed and went downstairs after we drank our soup and lined up against the wall of the building in twos, in rows of twos. So my sister and I were standing together. <clears throat> and some of these children were very young and some were older than us. And they were all actually quite sick. So it was very difficult to do this and watch them drag themselves line up against the wall in twos until everybody was out of the building. And there were Nazis, men in Nazi uniforms standing every few uh, rows of children, so quite a number of them. And there were a lot of kids in the hospital. And then when everybody was ready and lined up, they said, start walking, go forward, march. And they made sure that we did at quite a pace which was really exhausting. And we kept walking and walking and walking and it started to rain. This was like maybe November, mid-November, when it didn't always snow at that time, it often rained in the winter. So we were getting soaking wet and walking from very, very early in the morning until it got dark again. And there was the point during this walk when I said to my sister, I, I can't walk anymore. I just want to sit down and put my briefcase down. And my sister said, 
get up and let's go and give me your briefcase. So she actually carried my briefcase for quite a bit of the walk in order for me to make it easier for me to walk. And finally, it was getting dark and we got to this, we must have been walking all across the city. We got to this huge, huge building and we were told to go inside and there were already a lot of kids there sitting everywhere on the floor against the wall. There was barely any room to walk in for the new arrivals, but we did. And my sister, who was quite, could be quite aggressive, kind of uh, told other kids to move over and got us a space so we could sit down and lean against each other and hold on to our briefcases. When it got completely dark in the room, it was announced that we would get no supper, but we'd get breakfast, so we should all go to sleep. So after a while, all the kids were hungry and tired and miserable and crying, but after a while, sleep took over. At which point my sister nudged me and said, we can now share the bread we saved. So before falling asleep, we actually were able to eat something and not be totally starving and able to go to sleep. And before going to sleep, I said to my mother, I mean, uh, to my sister, how is our mother going to find us here? And with her usual charm, she said, I don't know, shut up and go to sleep. So we did, keeping each other warm by leaning against each other. Now, while this was going on, my mother actually returned to the city with the right papers and went straight to the Red Cross building to get us out of there. And when she got to the building, she saw that um, there were two Nazi officers standing by the door guarding the building. And as she walked up to them, they said to her, can we help you? And she immediately knew that something was wrong. And she said, what is this building? Uh, is this some sort of a, a hospital? I see the cross, the Red Cross. And they said, yes, this was the Red Cross building, but the kids had been taken out of here. They were transport, they're being transported to another place. So now we'll just, do something else with the building. At which point my mother said, oh, I'm at the wrong place. And she turned around immediately and left because she knew that something was dreadfully wrong. She went straight to the hospital where the doctor was working. And he said to her, and she explained to him what happened. And he said to her, I'll see what I can do. I'll, I'll, I'll try to take care of it. Um, stay here and I'll work on this. So my mother waited at the hospital and sure enough, the doctor came up with a solution. My mother didn't know this before, but the doctor was connected to the Jewish underground. He wasn't Jewish, but he was trying to save Jews. So he was connected to the Jewish underground and the Jewish underground were people who handed out these safe passes, false documentation to save people. And they also did things like they had some Nazi uniforms and one of the young men working in the underground put on a uniform, came over to the hospital, took the safe pass, took the new birth certificates that my mother uh, collected for Judith and me. And the doctor figured out where we had been taken through his connections. I don't know how. And this young Jew dressed as a Nazi showed up the next morning at the place where we were being held. The place where we were being held used to be like a a storage place for building materials. So he showed up there. And so the next morning, he showed our paperwork to the concierge. And from our end, what happened was that 
we were woken up and it was still dark. The door opened and this young Nazi stood in the doorway and shouted into the room, Judith and Erica, come here. He didn't tell us our last names. And as we woke up hearing our names, I said to my sister, he's wearing a Nazi uniform, let's not go. And my sister said, don't be stupid. He's, we're the only ones he's calling, get up and let's go. So she dragged me up, took our briefcases, walked us to the door and said, I'm Judith, this is Erica. And this young Nazi said, don't say a word. I'm going to take you out of here. Don't ask any questions, just come. So he took us to the front desk and said, these are the two kids, here are their papers. They were brought here by mistake. The officer early in the morning could care less whether there were two kids being taken out of there. So he said, check the paperwork. He said, okay, take them. So we walked outside, <clears throat> it was very cold outside. It had snowed the night before and we trudged through the snow and the officer said to us, I'll carry your briefcases, you come with me and we're gonna take a couple of streetcars and keep quiet. Don't talk on the streetcars, don't talk, don't ask any questions. We had no choice. We obeyed him, we got on the streetcars and there were not just people going to work on the streetcars but quite a few other Nazi officers who kind of saluted each other and looked at us and smiled at us, thinking we were probably this guy's children. And we traveled through a couple of stops and then changed streetcars and another couple of stops. And then we got off and we walked around a neighborhood we had never been in. And we walked into a building and the officer took us into the concierge's room and my mother was there. And my mother thanked this officer and he left. And she said, you're safe, you're okay. This always makes me want to cry. And, but before we go upstairs, we have an apartment here, but before we go upstairs, you have to learn your new names. And I became, my name was Erica, which was fine. And my last name became Poyak instead of Fabian. And my sister's name from Judith, which sounded a little Jewish, she became Edith Poyak. And while we were at it, my mother also insisted that we learn the Lord's Prayer, the Catholic version of the Lord's Prayer. And she also told us that we were not Christian. And if anybody said, what is your religion? We have to say we are Protestants, not Catholic, but Protestants, because the maid was Protestant and her family was not Catholic. And uh, she said, if you ever, ever tell anybody that you're Jewish, we're all going to get killed. So this was a lesson that uh, was kind of taught to me very early never to say I'm Jewish. And in a way, it stood me in good stand for many years. For example, uh, as an adult, I worked for 10 years in Indonesia. And the first question they would ask is Christian, and I would say yes. So this is where I learned to lie. Anyway, we learned the Lord's Prayer. We learned our new names. My mother took us upstairs and into an apartment and Irene was there. Now, this apartment was, the, was owned by the brother of the doctor's wife. And this brother was fighting on the Russian front. And she thought that as long as we needed a place to stay and we had Christian papers now, we could stay in this, house, in this apartment because it was a Christian building. So here we stayed during the war and my mother was so terrified of me giving away the fact that we were not really Christian that she didn't want to, she didn't want us to go down to the basement even when fighting started very heavily in the capital between the 
Russians who were coming into Budapest and the Germans who were defending their position in Budapest. And bombs were falling all over the place. And in fact, a bomb hit the building next door to us. And I said to my mother, you know, we don't wanna die here with the next bomb hitting this building. Let's go down to the basement. I know who we are and I will never give away that we're Jewish. I know you pray in Hebrew at night. Have I said anything about it? Let's go down to the basement. I know we're Christian. In fact, we used to play with other kids in the building before the heavy bombing began. So it was obvious that I knew how to behave and what to say about ourselves. So finally, my mother got convinced. We went downstairs, went into the basement, found ourselves a couple of chairs, four chairs. We sit, sat down. Now the basement, which was basically a bomb shelter, was a long L-shaped thing. And once we settled down and we had to stay there overnight, sitting up, sleeping, I wanted to entertain myself so I would get off the chair and kind of walk or dance down this hallway between the chairs and sing songs that I learned in nursery school when I was three years old and my mother sent me to a nursery school. <clears throat> and people thought I was very cute and so they would give me things. They would give me a piece of bread, they would give me a carrot, whatever they had. And I would take it back to our seats and give it to my mother and say, I'm earning the bread for the family now. Well, Christmas came around and I don't know how, but people started bringing in flour and uh, yeast and started baking in their apartments. And then they would bring down the cookies or whatever they were baking for Christmas. They would bring them down into the basement. So one of these days I was dancing around as usual and the woman next, sitting next to us called me over and said, um, do you know these cookies? Does your mother bake these kinds of cookies? And she showed me what she had baked. And I looked at my mother's face and her face was completely frozen because what she expected me to answer was, we're Jewish, we don't celebrate Christmas. Instead, I said, where we come from, we don't make these kinds of cookies. And I could see my mother breathing again. The woman laughed and thought I was so cute that she gave me a couple of cookies, which of course I shared with my mother and sister. So this is how we spent the war. And after the war, because my mother found out that my father had died, in fact, my father died of typhoid fever and double pneumonia in a hospital in Bergen-Belsen. And if you can imagine that this was a man who before the war weighed a little bit over 200 pounds because he was very muscular and an avid sportsman. He weighed 45 pounds when he died. So this was all in his documents. My mother didn't know what to do after the war because essentially all her relatives were dead. And then she found that she needed to work. So she put my sister and me into uh, boarding schools. Basically they were orphanages. They were an orphanage and there were a lot of kids there most of whom were either completely orphaned because of the war or half orphaned. And it was a really horrible place and the food was so terrible that I could barely eat it. But my big consolation was that I was allowed to read the school, I mean, the place where we were living. It was both a school and a uh, home, uh, had a big bookcase full of books. And because I could read and because I read very fast, the librarian took a liking to me and she allowed me to borrow books, not once a week, but two or three times a week. As often as I finished a book, I could bring it to her and she would give me another book. 
So that is how I survived a couple of years in a home. Plus I was going to school. And in 1948, three years after the war ended, my mother remarried and we had a home again in a, in a, a suburb of the capital, Budapest, and it was called Uipest. And it was a nice suburb and very nice, little, like a small town. And we had a private home, which was very unusual in a communist country. By that time, the communists had taken over the country's government. And it looked like life was going to be fine again, except my mother wasn't happy. Her marriage wasn't working out. And she was looking for a way to escape from Hungary so we could um, leave the country and she could leave her marriage. She, in fact, got a divorce from my stepfather because if we succeeded in leaving the country, he could say he had nothing to do with us or he didn't know about it because they were no longer married. Because of the housing shortage in communist Hungary, we could live with him even though they weren't married because we were just occupying a couple of rooms in his house. So my mother found a way for us to escape. And the escape route was from a town in northern, uh, northwestern Hungary, uh, Komarum, and across the Danube at Komarum to Komarno, which was a Slovak city, and from there to Bratislava. This was all arranged by a man uh, who was officially a man smuggler and it ma he made it his- Anthony Fabian, WhatsApp audio. Sorry. <laughs> he made it his business to uh, smuggle people across the borders from communist countries to freedom in Austria. Well, that didn't work out either and we got caught at the Slovak border at gunpoint chased by dogs. My mother spent a year in prison in Bratislava and my sister did as well, except um, eight months late and I was put into a children's uh, reform institute. Uh, eight months later, my mother discovered a relative in Prague and wrote to him and he came and he was a prominent journalist. So he came and bailed out my sister from jail, bailed me out from the children's jail and promised that we would stay with him till the Hungarian government claimed us to come back to Hungary. So between August of 1953 and December of 1953, my sister and I lived in Prague uh, my uncle rented a room at a widow's apartment and I started school in September in a Czech school. While I was in the children's prison, I actually learned Slovak fluently. And when we went to Prague, my uncle hired a teacher to teach me Czech, which was very similar to Slovak. So it was easy for me to pick up that language. And so I just went to school like a visitor in a Czech school, and I had a great time. That was the year in 1953 when the Soviet ruler, Stalin, died. So the political environment in both Hungary and Czechoslovakia and the other Russian occupied countries changed. So when the Hungarian government claimed us to come home again in January of 1954, the polit politics had changed and we were kept in jail for about a month in Hungary. But after that, the government said my mother and my sister had served enough of a jail sentence and I had been young enough not to know any better. So they let us go home and we went back actually to my stepfather's house. Um, two years later, in 1956, the Hungarian youth, actually, 
mostly university students, rebelled against the continued oppression by the Russians and a revolution broke out in Hungary. And one of the things that happened during that revolution was that they took all the mines out from the borders between Hungary and Austria. So people were able to cross without the danger of being blown up by a mine. When this happened, my mother, my sister and I decided to leave the country again. And it was another really dreadful trip across mud fields at the border. We hired actually a former secret police officer and paid him to help us get across to make sure that this time we would get into Austria. And we did. And then in Austria, we spent about a month in Austria. My mother contacted all the right agencies um, who would help us. And my father had three brothers, actually, all of whom survived the war. One of them went before the war to South Africa. Another one before the war went to Israel. And the third one, who actually had been in a concentration camp during the war, when the war was over, left Hungary and came to America and lived in Dover, Delaware. He was a rabbi. And my mother decided that she's had enough of wars and revolutions. We were not going to go to Israel. We would go to America. And my rabbi uncle sponsored us. So after about a month in Vienna, we were able to obtain official permission from the American government. And with the sponsorship of my rabbi uncle, we were flown from Austria to Dover, Delaware, where my uncle picked us up and we went to live with him for a while. Um, my mother, after about a month of living with them, got a job in New York as a housekeeper. My sister went to um, live with relatives in New York and I spent this, I went to school and learned English. And, and after the first six months of living in Dover, Delaware, that summer, I also got a job being a mother's helper in Long Beach, New York for the summer. Then that September, an aunt of my, an aunt of my uncle, no, yeah, an aunt of my uncle, uh, invited me to live with her in McMechan, West Virginia and finish my last year of high school. So I went to McMechan and finished high school with honors. Then by this time, my stepfather managed to leave Hungary legally and my mother and he remarried and he brought some money with him. So he set up a business in New York and they had a very nice apartment so once again, my sister and I could go and live with my mother. I started school in New York, went to Hunter College, studied theater and writing English because my dream was to become an actress and a writer. While I was going to school there, I was introduced to a very handsome young man and fell madly in love and married him at age 19 and continued going to college. But a year later, my husband got a Fulbright grant. That's my dog in the background. <laughs> and we moved to Peru for two years. In Peru, in Peru, I learned Spanish and continued my career in acting. I learned pantomime while I couldn't speak Spanish and did a lot of shows as a pantomimist. I took dance classes. I became basically a professional actress in Peru. When we came back from Peru, I finished uh, in the theater department of Northwestern University. I got a degree in theater, minor in writing. And we moved to San Francisco where I opened an acting school 
and my husband was teaching at the University of San Francisco. Three years later, my husband got a job in Mexico City. So we moved to Mexico where I continued to teach at the University of Mexico and at the Film School of Mexico. We had two children by now. Somewhere my two sons were born in between all this activity. And we lived in Mexico. But this was a time in Mexico when uh, marriages were falling apart. And I met a National Geographic photographer who needed help in doing a story on Mexico City. And while I was helping him uh, do his story because I could speak Spanish and I knew everybody in Mexico City who was anybody because they knew me because I was an actress and I used to do commercials. So I was often seen on television. So while all this was happening, uh, this photographer and I decided that he would help me go back to Hungary and do an, uh, the geographic was doing an assignment in Hungary and this photographer, his name was Albert Moldvay, took over from the previous photographer and I went with him to be his interpreter in Hungary. Well, after that job for the following two years, I worked with Albert Moldvay as his assistant all over Europe, different assignments. And finally, my husband said to me, I, you're spending six months of the year working outside the house with him and I would like a full-time wife. So I decided, I made a very difficult decision and opted for a career in photography with the photographer. And, and my children went to boarding school in England. My first husband got a job in Paris so he could visit my children in England quite often. And whenever I wasn't on assignment with Albert, I would go to England and see my children and my children would come and stay with me. So our lives became a little bit complicated, but ultimately successful. My older son is a, now a world renowned LASIK eye surgeon with his own clinic. My younger son, is a well-known filmmaker whose first film won 25 awards and he's working currently on a film. Ironically, he will be filming it in Hungary. And um, my older son has three children who are extremely good students and very bright. So despite all the complications of our lives, um, I think we've all done all right. I have published over 20 books. Would you mind showing some of them? And um, hello, can you show the books? And continue writing. I'm finishing, not, this was my mother, sister, here are my books, some of my books. Nope, yeah. And uh, they've uh, all been published by various publishers. And the book I'm writing now is basically a true story fictionalized about all this that I have told you. And it's called Liar's Paradise and I hope to publish it this year. And I am ready for questions, except I want to finish with one last sentence, which is that if I could survive all this, I think, and become what I wanted to become, which is a professional artist, writing books and taking pictures, photography, which carried me all over the world with a very successful career. I would say to anybody who is listening, you can do it too. You can succeed in your life. It's not easy and you have to work at it, but you can make it. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Erica. We have um, two questions for you. The first is, 
Do you remember all these details or is most of your story from what your mother and sister were able to tell you in later years? You know, it's a curious thing. I have a photographic memory and I actually remembered all this very vividly. I think there are two kinds of people. If horrible things happen to you in life, some people erase it. Like my second husband didn't know anything about his early childhood because it was not very good. And I knew everything about my childhood because I lived through it and I retained the memory of it. So in fact, my mother and my sister and I almost never talked about the war. I didn't talk about the war until a few years ago when I met somebody else who was a survivor and he suggested that I approach the uh, Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust as a survivor and tell my story. And that is when I started to tell my story. Never before, but I remembered it. Yes. And we have another question. Um, how was your mother able to make so many correct decisions to save your lives so many times? Um, were you just, uh, was, was she just shrewd and clever or did she have access to information that others didn't? She had no information. She was an incredibly clever person. And she did have very good connections because my father had very good connections with his business. And my mother was a very talented business person and she worked with him. So she was able to utilize the acquaintances that she had to rescue us. She was a very, 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 very smart person. And we have, this question is from one of our audience members says, what languages do you still speak well? Thank you. My mom and I have been listening and appreciate your time for telling your life story. Well, I speak fluently, obviously, English. I speak Spanish every single day, practically, because I live in Los Angeles. And almost everybody who comes to my house and helps me with gardens and pool and housekeeping and all that and stores, people speak Spanish. So I practice Spanish almost every day and I love it. And I speak Hungarian quite fluently because I maintained it. And over the years of my travel around the world uh, for assignments, we would always stay three, four months in a place. So I learned every single country's language, at least enough to ask questions, where is this, where is that, which way do we go, and be able to actually converse with people. And those are about six or seven different languages. The only language I couldn't acquire was Chinese. And do you know what happened to the doctor who helped you? You know, I have no idea. My mother probably stayed in touch with him, but I don't know. And it's a very strange thing. But um, after the war, uh, I don't know who my mother stayed in touch with. Her sister came back, she had a half sister who came back after the war, but two of her other siblings were killed and most of my aunts and uncles. And I don't know what happened to people. And when did you move to Los Angeles? Uh, in 1975, I moved back from Mexico to Los Angeles this time with my second mate. He wasn't my husband at the time, but we lived together. And I went back to UCLA and got a Master of Fine Arts, again, in theater. And a year or two later, Albert and I started teaching photography at UCLA called Photographing the National Geographic Way. And we continued to teach that together for nearly 20 years. Albert died in 1995, and I continued to teach at UCLA for another couple of years. 
So it was like a 20 year teaching at the extension. One of the questions says, I am a teacher of middle school students. How can I encourage kids during difficult times such as these? You know, I have two ways of living today. In fact, I didn't know whether to bring this up or not, but today we're living through a very tragic and very difficult environment and times. People are dying through a virus or due to a virus. And how do you live through that? You accept what is happening. You do what you can to not get ill. You stay at home. You only go out when you have to go out. And you simply live your life the best way you can to make yourself comfortable and to do things to keep yourself busy so that you don't despair and you don't feel imprisoned, but you realize that these are unusual circumstances and you do the best you can to continue studying. I continue writing my book, it's almost finished. I continue reading. I hardly ever watch television because the news are the same everywhere, but I walk my dog every day. I cook food. I do repairs around my house that I didn't get to before. So I make myself busy and accept what is. I know it will pass, but I can't sit around and wait for it to pass. So I do every single day things that are necessary and important, and some of it to entertain myself. Thank you very much for that answer. Were any of the people who helped you honored as righteous among the nations? I wouldn't know. I, I like I said, I, after the war, everybody kind of disappeared. Okay, well, I think those are all of the questions we have. Thank you again so much, Erica, um, for sharing your story. This is a second of many other Holocaust survivor talks that we will be hosting digitally during this time. And before we sign off, I wanna let you know that while the museum is closed, we will regularly be providing compelling virtual programs like this one on Tuesday, April 7th at 11 o'clock Pacific time, I will be giving a talk about genealogy research techniques for Holocaust survivors and their families. And I'll be sharing some research tactics and showing examples of documents I've um, located for survivors in our community. Um, please follow this Facebook page and visit our website lamoth.org for the most up-to-date information about our programs. Thank you again for joining us and we wish everyone a happy Passover and Easter and thank you again so much, Erica, for sharing your story. You're very welcome and good health to everybody and we'll survive this one too. Thank you. <laughs>